Thank you, and good morning, everyone. It's really good to be here to share in this meeting and meet with, I think, a, a very diverse group of people, but all of us from our, our different roles and our different positions having an interest in infrastructure and how we improve the infrastructure that we have to the benefit of our society. And what I want to talk about this morning is really that process of serving society's needs, how it is we connect our work to what society needs. Perhaps a, a little more of a soft subject than some of the hard technologies that uh, I've often been involved in, and I expect a lot of you have, but it's, it's about the impact of our work. So, as I say, this, this is a great platform to be on, I think, to, to share in this stuff, because this work that we've been doing through CSIC over a good many years now has been really quite pioneering in pushing us all further into this space and achieving ultimately greater benefits for our society. So what do we mean by smart infrastructure? Well, I've used in this presentation a few graphics that I'm sure some of you will have seen before because they're CSIC graphics. But we're talking about this world of physical infrastructure and digital infrastructure and how we bring the two things together to, to achieve benefit. And it's across all sorts of individual sectors. My background, as you've just been hearing, is almost entirely in the transport sector. But actually, we could look at energy or communications or water and so on. There are, are common issues. What I'm going to offer you this morning, though, are, are some personal reflections. They're nobody's views but my own, if you like. Um, but they're things that come from things that have bugged me a bit, perhaps. Um, said here, some of them actually start with some of my frustrations about our, our industry and our performance. But I, I'm going to try and turn that round and, and make some positive suggestions by asking some questions. And the, the questions are really, what does our society need from us? What does our sector need? And perhaps where are the opportunities in our sector? And then I'm going to explore that with some examples and... Uh, some specific suggestions at the end. So, where are we today as a sector? Well, we're a long-established industry. We've been literally building infrastructure in this country for thousands of years. Um, we are vital to the nation, to the performance of all our, our national systems. Economically, we're very important. So these are all positives. These are good things. These are reasons to, to be proud to be involved in what we do. We also have some other characteristics, particularly the, the civil infrastructure sector. We're quite horizontally integrated. We, uh, that turns out to be quite significant. We, we divide ourselves up and we tend to focus on individual stages in the life cycle of, of projects. We have some long established ways of doing things, which um, again, may, may be a strength. We have a lot of experience. Sometimes it might be a limitation as well. But we do see some changing practices. And, and we have a number of quite big challenges that face our sector as a whole. Carbon, sustainability, energy related issues. That's becoming a huge challenge to us. We have a patchy health and safety record. And we're not very good at recognising the importance of welfare. That's something that's growing. And we're very resource constrained as an industry. We're struggling to, to bring enough people in to, to train them to do the right things with them. So, so we're a bit of a mixed picture, but that's, that's my sort of snapshot of how I see our industry today. So what does society need from us? Why do we actually construct and operate infrastructure? Here's a big suite of infrastructure. I rather, rather like this photo. I found it the other day. It's actually a, one that the Mayor of London has used to talk about city development, but uh, it, just, it appealed to me because it's got my new office in the bottom. <laughs> um, but it's a good view of a city. It makes you think about the, the range of different things in there. If we, if we look at that and think about just transport, say, there's roads, there's river, there's 
the hidden railway systems underground. What does society want from us in all of that? So does society want infrastructure? Sounds a bit of a strange question, but I think it's quite an important one. Um, I don't think society does directly want infrastructure, actually. I think what society wants are the outcomes. Society wants the ability to undertake different functions, to communicate, to move, that sort of thing. And the infrastructure that we get very excited about is actually a little bit secondary. So here's my new job, or at least the context of my new job. Um, if you don't recognize the viewpoint, this is taken uh, obviously at very high altitude, but um, probably somewhere over central south London, southeast London perhaps. And that's a view of the Thames estuary and out over the North Sea with the dawn coming up in the distance. Uh, you can probably make out uh, over that side the port of Tilbury, one of the UK's major commercial ports. And the project I've now moved to um, is creating a transport link across that in estuary. More or less in the middle of the picture, the plan is to drive a, a new set of tunnels, some very large tunnels, 16 and a half metres diameter or thereabouts, to take uh, dual carriageway, three lanes per carriageway traffic across the river. That prospect for me as a tunneler is very exciting. There's me on a Monday morning. <laughs> that gets me going a bit. I'm, maybe it's a, a strange position, but that's my perspective. I enjoy this sort of work. I enjoy the challenge. But actually, what society is after is, is not the satisfaction of digging a big hole. Some of us like digging holes for ourselves, but not everybody. Um, what society needs is connectivity and congestion relief. Fundamentally, the transport problem in this part of the UK is that there is very limited connection across the Thames once you get downstream of London. The, the few connections that there are are desperately stretched for capacity, so they suffer long delays and considerable congestion. Even last night, I was delayed for over an hour trying to cross the river in this area on my way here. Monday morning rush hour will probably have been worse. So society needs connectivity and congestion relief. Those are the, the things we're looking for. The form of the transport link, the technologies we use, all the stuff that gets a lot of us excited isn't actually that important really to society. It wants the outturn. So we are creating our infrastructure because it has a value. Value is a key word here. We're not doing it for fun, although I'm a firm believer that having a bit of fun in doing our work is a good thing. Um, we're not doing it just because we have the ability to do it. We need to think about how we, we express that when we talk about our work. We need to talk about how we <coughs> communicate the benefits of what we're doing. I don't actually think, as an industry, we're very good at that, and I think it sometimes holds us back. So what's valuable to our society? Well, there's a whole list of things I could um, come up with. Um, they're not necessarily things that are all expressed in, in obvious engineering parameters, but when you look at that list, I, I doubt if many people will disagree that they're all important things. We want good health, we want security, we want to have our ability to communicate and to travel we get very interested in things like quality of life and so on. That's, that's all good stuff. That's what society values. And, and it's changing over time. Big one at the moment um, that's definitely going up the agenda, and I think quite rightly, is um, pressure on the control of carbon, carbon net zero by 2050 as a target. Those are the kind of things that are valuable to our society. Is that the language of our industry, though? Um, not sure. What do you think? Do you think our industry is focused on all of those things? I think it's a mixed bag, actually. 
TfL, my former employer, actually has started to become much more alive to this. So TfL um, and the current mayor, who's, who drives the policies, talks a lot more now about some of these sorts of things or the, the consequences of them. So things like air quality and affordable housing become much more overtly the drivers, and, and you see that reflected in the transport agency, which now talks about improving air quality and providing housing as being reasons for developing transport projects. Um, not something perhaps we would have done a little while ago. We try and turn it into technical specification when we look at projects, and we, we start to use some of these sort of words quite a lot more. Um, the sort of things that could come into a specification. Can we relate these directly to our smart technologies? Can we relate them to the, the, the sort of work we're going to hear about this week, in the next few days? Can we also communicate what our technology, because a lot of us probably know the technology end of the equation best, can do to uh, address some of these needs, some of these challenges. My personal take on it is we're trying, we're getting better, but we're not that great at making all of these connections, at relating the things we do to the, the big picture needs of society. We're, we're prone, when we get into technology, to end up with what I would term solutions looking for problems. We come up with clever widgets and then wonder why it's clever, what it can do. Um, we also have on the client side, where I spend a lot of my time, quite a lot of frustration that we have persistent needs and we don't seem to move forward on them. We don't seem to find ways of addressing them. So I, I think there's some communication issues here which are a challenge to us and where we could do better. So really out of that, I could, I could crystallise that actually in, into two challenges that I think face us all. One of them is about spotting the opportunities where, where we have technology, where, where we have new abilities, we've worked out ways of doing things. How do we connect that back to those high-level aspirational needs of our society? Uh, and the other one is about really the two-way communication between uh, the different sides, about raising awareness both ways. Let's think about communication a bit first. So this starts with the needs of society. How should society communicate its needs? I've said I think client organisations get frustrated sometimes with the inability to do certain things. Do they communicate that? So he, here's a simple, idealised sort of view of our world. I've, I've divided us up into two camps for convenience. There are some of us, probably myself included, who predominantly sit there as infrastructure clients. And there are others of us who are maybe more down um, in, in the detail doing the, the technology development. And what we want is a sort of symbiotic relationship where... We all talk to each other, so the client can express its demand for new abilities, capabilities, um, and perhaps with a bit of help, there's some facilitation needed in the middle, which is where quite a lot of the industry comes in. We can turn that sometimes into specific technical requirements, which we can communicate down to the developers. And then there's some stuff that goes the other way around. There, there's some stuff that actually originates down with the developers who come up with the innovations, um, and then, again, with a bit of facilitation, perhaps turn that into a description of what new processes, what new opportunities there are that the clients can be fed with. And, and we could happily go around that cycle and perhaps get quite a long way. But my frustration is it often doesn't happen. I, I get frustrated, I keep using that word because it does frustrate me, I get frustrated by the time it takes for some of the technologies and changes that we see in the technical world to work their way through. In my career, I've watched things like fiber optics, we've heard reference to, wireless sensor networks, uh, a number of technologies around digital imaging, 
And they, they've all progressed. They all have huge technical capability. And all of them, over a period of 20 years or so, have progressed, but at different speeds. Fiber optics, probably getting there now, and we'll hear more about that this week. Wireless set sensor networks, actually, I would say, have become the norm in, certainly in the sector I've been working in, if we're instrumenting in a metro system, something like that. Digital imaging, huge potential, in my view, very, very little penetration of the real market. So it's very, very sort of delayed adoption sometimes. Why is it so slow? Why don't we get that nice cycle of stuff? Well, there's all sorts of reasons, of course. A lot of it actually is probably to do with all the different organizations in our supply chains, the way we split things up contractually, budgetary constraints, demands of specific projects, so on and so forth. But there's, there's communication that's not always wonderfully effective there. So how do we communicate needs and opportunities? We need our clients to sometimes speak more clearly into the sector. We need people to describe their needs, what they want, more systematically. Um, we probably need more forums. We probably need more of this sort of forum. Uh, but I think often the reality is what goes on is quite ad hoc. People pursue the things they're interested in. You need p individual, individuals to champion things. Um, that doesn't always happen. And then the technology developers, the, the other side of the cycle, need to invest in understanding the client needs. Because often the very good ideas, I think, don't get expressed back to the clients in, in the right language. So I, I would suggest that the developers sometimes need to, to ask quite deliberately how their developments, their innovations could be applied, what, what they allow us to do differently. A characteristic of our industry, certainly the construction industry, is we love to live in silos. I'm the planner, I'm the designer, I'm the contractor, and so on. We, we don't communicate across boundaries all that well. We need to break out of that behavior. So let's think for a moment about the client. What does the client need to do? Well, here's something I think quite positive from TFL. Um, this is a, a statement that was put out by TFL uh, just a few years back now, um, describing what TFL's priorities were. Uh, and for me, this, this is great at a high level, because if you, you look at the bits I've highlighted in there, particularly the bits in red, this is a client organization starting to identify the technical elements of what it needs. We're starting to, to get the client describing things that might be helpful to, to latch on to. Things like growth, capacity, affordability, faster results, so on. So a few more questions. How, how can we get better at describing these needs? How can we get better at communicating this? And how can we make really good systematic choices a, around these needs? And having played with this, worried about this a bit for a while, one of the things that struck me is that I think there's quite a strong analogy with the procurement world. I spent quite a lot of time doing big procurements. And, and there are some techniques that have been evolving and, and that we've been learning there, which have helped. And, and one that I find really helpful is what we term a value model. It's a very simple little equation. We're, we'll define value as being the quality of a proposal divided by its cost. Quality is a, a measure of the benefits that something uh, presents. There, there might be a whole range of different benefits, so it's a summation of those things. The cost is the cost. The, the quality can be both about the product is, itself, and it might also be about the delivery mechanism. It's no good me promising you that I'll solve the communication problem at the Thames with my new teleport system because you won't believe me. 
it might have very high capacity, but you wouldn't rely on the answer. So it's not a high value suggestion. We need to balance out those things. The cost, of course, should be based on a whole life view of the asset, as uh, Robert was touching on earlier. But there's a basis for making choices between ideas, for ranking ideas, for prioritizing things. The value, of course, gets better if you, as you push the quality up or the cost down. And usually, the choices we'll make will be based on the ones that come out numerically highest value. The clever bit is in adjusting, pursuing the elements of the quality score so that we maximize the value. And this is helping quite a lot in procurement. It's, making, it's helping us move away from a fixation with pure cost in procurement into a space where we think more about a, a rounded picture of value. So just to, to play it through, here's a very simple example. If I want to choose a car, here's my value model for a car, very simple one. You could think of lots of other things to put in it, but I'm going to say the three things I'm interested in are speed, capacity, and comfort of the car. And that's fine, those are things you can measure, but you also need to know how much I care about those. So I'm going to tell you I'm 90% in it for speed, 5% for capacity, and 5% for comfort. It's all about speed. So what you'll offer me is something like that. That's a response to the value model. But I could probably influence your behavior by giving you a different distribution of what I'm interested in. I'll uh, maximize the comfort, please, and I'll have lots of capacity. And then the value model will give me a different answer. It might tell me I want one of those. I hope you can see there what I'm trying to say. We, we can start to describe value, and, and to an extent, we, we start to determine the outputs we're getting. And, and the great thing about that is I can be the client, and I can say those are the things that matter to me. And if you're the, the car dealer, you can look at it, and you can interpret it. We've got a communication going. We're talking to one another in the same language about what the proposition does. There's that cost term in there. That, that's always a bit of a, a challenge to us in certainly anything uh, in the transport sector. I don't want to dwell on it too much today, but of course the concern we all have is that if the cost concern is too big, we end up with a rusty bicycle rather than a car. So if we applied this to infrastructure, what would, what would it look like? What would we put as the, the components that we value? I'm a client. I want to buy some infrastructure. You're a supplier of technologies for infrastructure. How do I commun What am I going to tell you that I actually value? Well, here's a little mock-up, if you like, of what I might say. Don't worry too much about the numbers. They're just, just to populate the table. But... This is how I might describe what I'm looking for, I think, in, in your infrastructure offering. I, I'd have a series of different qualities, as I've called them there, on the, the left-hand side. Quite a diverse mix of things, but they're all things that are important to me. So I'd like, I'd like to see some of all of those. Then, when someone comes up with a proposal, we have some options to look at, I'm going to score them. So the second column, the, the impact is my assessment of, of how the proposition fares in terms of those things. The great thing about that is if you're the technology provider, you can score yourself before the client ever does. We can all start to look at the same thing. We might put some weighting in there as well. That's probably a client prerogative to say which things are most precious for a particular problem, and then we'll multiply it all up and, and generate a score. And what we've now got is an auditable, objective, reasonably objective way of assessing a proposal and, and identifying whether or not something has, has met the need. So to me, that's, that's perhaps a helpful tool for thinking about how we describe what we do. It's quite interesting, I think, as well, just to reflect uh, on 
what the bits are made up of. There's quite a lot of stuff over there about people. We'll come back to people. There's quite a lot of stuff inevitably about the performance of the asset. And there's quite a bit of stuff about sustainability. And I think those themes must come through in whatever we do. So however we're, we're describing the benefits we're achieving from smart infrastructure, what we're looking for as a client, what we're providing as a developer, I think we probably should be looking for those three things. I think we should be expecting there to be some sort of impact on, on people and performance of the asset and sustainability. So now, the value model idea is trying to, to push us into some objective assessment of our proposals. It gives us a tool to think about how we might compare things, whether things meet our, our needs, which ideas are the best ideas. It's, I hope, helpful in that way. What it's not, and this, this is important, it's not something that inhibits blue sky thinking here. I'm not saying that if you're perhaps in a research laboratory developing something truly novel, you need to be constrained by some set of requirements imposed externally. But what I do think you probably should be doing, even in that research laboratory context, is just taking stock every so often, testing yourself, asking the questions, can I relate the product I'm creating back to these needs? I think that's a good exercise to be doing. Because we are all in a, an engineering sector. We are dealing in applied science. The value in what we do is through its return, ultimately, to society. So how, how could we use it to promote the potential? Well, for the technology developers, it, it's a way of demonstrating value, because otherwise we just get hung up on the cost of what people are proposing. And it, it is a way of enabling the developer to, to think about and relate his work to the wider needs. For the clients, the reason why we like it in procurement is because it gives us a logical, auditable way of prioritizing. But it's also a communication tool. When we started using the value model type of concept in procurement, one of the big benefits was that we got our suppliers to understand what we wanted much faster. So it's a common language. And uh, it's... It's a way of sort of reiterating challenge to us as well, because one of the enemies of our, intra, our, uh, our industry sorry, is that we have a tendency to keep going and buying the same thing. Um, if we ask ourselves questions like this more systematically about value, we might actually sometimes buy something different, which might be what we need. Enough of all that. The other challenge I suggested was about spotting the potential for smart solutions. We've got a, a diverse range of people here. I'm sure all of us have something to offer in terms of smart infrastructure development, but it's probably many different specific things in many different areas. We need to collate that. We need to be able to... Um, identify where the big opportunities are. I find it quite helpful to, to bring this back to thinking about assets. I think assets are a good frame of reference for us because most of what we do is related to assets. So I'd like to propose that we actually exist in what I've called an infrastructure ecosystem. And that has various different things within it. It has the physical assets, the bridges, the tunnels, whatever it may be. It has the digital assets. We're becoming much, much more alive to the significance of the digital asset. But also, it, the one I think that's been a, a, 
something that's been growing realisation for me in, in recent times is there's also a, a people-based asset in the mix. Those three things actually, I think, are inseparable in creating successful smart infrastructure. So I'd like to just spend a little bit of time looking at those and looking at where the opportunities might lie. Ah, before I do that, I, I just revisited this, and this, this is uh, perhaps a little challenge about how we move our thinking on, because I showed this at the start. The uh, smart infrastructure is made up of, of physical and digital. What I'm perhaps proposing is there is a, a people dimension on there that allows us to pick up some other things that are really important. So welfare is a good example. The industry, construction industry generally, is not great on welfare, but is actually getting better at recognising that it's an issue. But, it, but it's also other things. Actually, expectations, aspirations have quite a significant impact on what we achieve. If people want to do something, that's actually a really big contribution to a successful project outturn. Behaviour is, is key. So, a slightly different view of... Um, what, or an expanded view of what might be involved in smart infrastructure. Coming back to this, though, let's, let's think for a minute about the physical assets. A lot of us, I suspect, in this room probably started off in the physical assets area. So a lot of this is about the products, the actual things we create, the bridge, the tunnel, whatever. In the construction industry, it's also quite a lot about the, the processes, if you like, the temporary works that we need in order to create the permanent works. The industry's moving a lot. There's a lot of um, pressure currently from government around efficiency and a big drivers to look at what currently uh, usually term modern methods of construction. The build off site illustration of the tunnel there, DFMA technologies. There is now an expectation, a presumption is the word that's used from government, that, that we will be using more manufacturing technologies in our construction. And it brings lots of benefits. It means less quality issues, less people issues and so on in the workplace because they're easier to control in a factory, divert the work to the factory, and make it an assembly task on site, offers numerous benefits. So we're quite good in that space, lots of exciting stuff going on. In my own sector, tunnelling, um, we've got some fantastic examples right through the history of the modern tunnelling industry, of continuous innovation. Um, it's usually driven by the values of efficiency, maybe quality, but I think usually efficiency, expediency. Um, but the industry has been really good at it. If you go back 150, 160 probably years to that picture, that was how we went about building an urban railway. Can you see any downsides to that approach? But hey, we're still travelling on the railway they built in London. There's fantastic innovation like the work the Brunels did, the tunnelling shield there on the, the top left, the, effectively the first tunnel boring machine. Right back in the 1820s, a few decades later it had got a bit, I'm not sure if it got more sophisticated, it had evolved a, a bit, cast iron linings and so on. This is tube construction, probably uh, rather over a century ago, again in the London Underground. Note the guys on the shovels there, we'll come back to shovels. We've moved on. The machine over there, 1960s, tunnel boring machine, it's actually passing through a station there, so you can see the whole, whole tunnelling shield. A lot of the principles of that machine, shoving it forward using hydraulic rams off the tunnel lining, 
They're very similar to the principles of the, the early Brunel machine. And we've gone on and on. These are some of our channel tunnel rail link machines a few years ago now. Um, a bit bigger, a bit more sophisticated. A slightly daunting prospect in my new job is uh, we're looking at tunnel boring machines that are just over twice the size of those. Um, it wouldn't fit in this room. We're talking about some very big, sophisticated machines, but it's evolution, it's, it's continual development. So the industry is quite good on some of that. It's quite good at a few different things. Um, ground treatment is one that uh, we've got better at. We can tunnel in much more difficult ground conditions than we used to manage. So top left there is uh, actually the construction of the Victoria Line. All those white pipes are ground freezing pipes. That's ice on the outside of the pipes because they're cold. Freezing the ground to enable tunneling next to the river back in the 60s. We, we have the odd hiccup in our development. The top right is uh, the first attempt at building a spiral escalator. Um, it was a nice idea. They uh, never quite got it to work, although you can still see a few little pieces of it in the London Transport Museum if you, uh, you go there. Not all the innovation is successful. We have the odd, the odd one that doesn't get through, but people are trying. It's quite, quite good to see that effort. Down at the bottom, we were so proud of this. 18 or so years ago, this was our super high-tech, state-of-the-art control room. Never saw so many cathode ray tubes and so on. That was controlling tunnel boring machines, bringing data in, start of a, a digital era, really, for controlling some of this work. We've come on a long way since that. This is more recent. This is Tottenham Court Road Station, from about five years ago now. Um, this is sprayed concrete technology. Um, you see an assortment of plant working there. It's actually, there's an excavator at the front <coughs> mining here rather than spraying at the moment that picture was taken. But spray concrete technology has come on a long way as well. Great innovation. But a thing that's troubled me for quite a long time is um, are these guys down in the corner. That, actually, they're working at Tottenham Court Road as well. I know that from the date. So they're on the same job as, as the guys up here. But the thing about these chaps is they're still digging by hand. We've still got the shovel in use. Why is that? We've got some challenges still. We're not all the way through a, an evolutionary journey. Why are we making people do that sort of arduous work? Come back to them. Another favorite CSIC graphic we're thinking about the physical asset. Um, the point's already been made in the introduction. It's very easy to get wrapped up in the excitement of the new build of construction processes. And that is where a lot of the, the energy in the industry goes. But we must also remember that most of our assets are already there. They're already in use. And when we think about what we do with our physical assets, it's really, really important that we focus more on the whole life management of uh, the existing asset as well as the, the little bit we've got in development. So here's, here's just a little bit of food for thought because I think we can, we can take that idea and think ahead a bit as an industry. What's, what's coming up? What's going to be the challenges in the future? So, Here's a little graphic which depicts the opening dates for metros around the world. Um, so this is just simply the date that the first part of the system opened. And if you look, it goes right back. We've got London over in the 1863 opening the, uh, the Metropolitan Railway. And then we've got a, a period around the start of the 20th century where actually there was quite a lot of activity. That's when a lot of the London Underground, some of the other big systems were, were really getting going. But remember, this is just 
the opening date for each metro, so each metro appears once. So, so it was picking up a bit around that time. It's a lull at the war, for obvious reasons. And then after the war, it got much more rapid, the development. And so in the 50s, 60s, 70s, we're starting to see metro construction really take off. If you go and look where this is, a lot of this will be places like the Americas or the cities of the Soviet Union. Lots and lots of metros were founded around that time. And that's carried on steadily until most recently it's really taken off again. If you look at that, that'll be China, India, Iran. Economies that have, cities that have emerged more recently. So what can we take from that? Well, the thing with, with my railway background that strikes me is uh, what's the life expectancy of railway systems? Well, we hope generally that the tunnels will last more or less indefinitely. So it's not so much the tunnels here that are the concern. It's the other systems. It's the trains. It's the signalling. Fundamentals of a metro railway. Well, actually, if you look at it, there's, there's quite a well-established life cycle for most of those things. It's around 40 or 50 years for a lot of them. They're pretty much life expired after that. So we get into renewals. You've seen this in London. The Victoria Line in London, the world's first automatic railway, built in the 1960s, upgraded with new signalling and new trains about 10 years ago. So you start to see a, a life cycle thing coming in. But what, with that thought, what leaps out at me from this graph is, is just in that metro sector, what this is telling us is the number of systems that are going to be coming up for renewal in the relatively near future, next decade or so, is going to grow dramatically. We need to be thinking about how we're going to address that sort of trend. And I'm sure there are trends like that in other infrastructure sectors. So there we are. To, to summarise the sort of where we are with the physical assets, um, it's where a lot of us started. There's lots we need to do, and we do need to pay attention to the ageing asset base we have. Let's look at the digital. Where are we with digital? Well, we've got loads of acronyms in digital, is one of my conclusions every time I look at it. Um, but actually, there's, there's lots going on, and, and we're all relatively familiar probably with things like BIM coming in, and uh, if, if you go to a design office now, you've got a good chance of seeing virtual reality in use. Um, in sort of sectors I work in. So, lots of good stuff. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because, particularly because of the potential impact. We said that the physical enhancements, from, as in that earlier graphic, are only a small proportion. The great thing about the digital enhancements is we can apply them to all of the infrastructure. So when we renew that metro system, the tunnels might be 100 years old, but we can put new signalling, new electronic control on the trains, we can get more capacity from it and deliver more out of it. So the impact of digital is huge. And again, we can be reasonably proud, I think, of what we've achieved. Oyster's over 15 years old. For those of you who aren't familiar with the London system, it's the contactless card system that was introduced in lieu of paper tickets. It's now getting to the end of its life, perhaps, because we use phones or contactless bank cards. And I love this statistic, which I came across a little while ago. Somebody had counted how many paper tickets were now used on the tram system in Croydon. And they came to the conclusion at the time they did it, it was 66 a day. It's probably half of that now. So lots is changing. We're, we're adopting new digital things. We've talked about trains. We're our digitally controlled metro. There's a renewed Victoria Line train. 90, 100 second headway is possible with the latest technology and high capacity with it. Communications all over the place. This is a control centre that controls uh, about a dozen highway tunnels and various other bits of critical highway infrastructure. It's all remote from the asset these days. When I first worked in highway tunnel maintenance, this was all guys sat in a room with a window overlooking the approach to the tunnel very, really quite limited 
technology. Now we've got all the information there. So there's lots of good stuff going on in the digital space. I think we've been a bit slow with getting it into maintenance, but we're starting to, to look at digital twins and things like that. And what can we do by scanning um, the asset and then interrogating the scan rather than having to be out there in person all the time? We do have, though, I think, some challenges in the digital sector. <laughs> Google image from, from somewhere, but I love this picture because this sums up for me the culture of a large part of our industry. The civil engineering industry does love a report. The thicker, the better. <laughs> we swamp people in stuff, how much of it gets read. And there, there is a real danger in digital that we do the same thing, of course. Um, so we, we've got a little journey summarised at the top there. We, once we've got this data, we need to manage the data. Then we need to, to get into the sense making. We need to find the patterns in it. And then we need to use that to inform our decision making. I think we've got quite a lot to do in that space, but it's real opportunity. I love these two images because to me, these are two spreadsheets. right? Or to put it another way, these are two things which could have been given to me in a spreadsheet and often would have been in the past. This one's quite old now, actually, but I still like it. Um, this is from a, an image-based monitoring system we developed some years ago. Uh, and the thing is of interest here is, can you see the red vectors on there? It, it gave us a, a real-time update where the vectors of movement were superimposed on the image of the tunnel so we could see what was happening. Much easier than interrogating a spreadsheet and understanding it. The, the other image there is more recent, actually. But again, it's something that used to be presented in a spreadsheet. And it's a little graphic that somebody came up with to describe the condition of assets in stations along a railway line. And they represented every station with a little graphic of a house. And there's a coding system behind this. So once you get familiar with the coding, you can look at this, look at a station, and, and know immediately what the issues in that station are. So here, this station, the, the roof bit, is red. It means there's a problem with the roof. Some of these stations are, are, are in blue. That means there's a water issue, water ingress issue, somewhere around those stations. But it's really good communication. Lots and lots of data, but very easy to assimilate. We need to do more of that sort of stuff. So digital is really important because it's probably where we can have greatest impact. But then my, my third category on here was people. Why should we treat people as assets? I'm not sure who came up with it first, but I quite like this definition of an asset. An asset is something we value. Well, we should value our people, shouldn't we? So immediately, they're assets and we depend on them. There is another reason why we should focus more as an industry, as a sector, on our people. It's quite a dark reason. This is a, a graphic from a mental health campaign in construction. In the UK, I don't know how it is elsewhere in the world, actually, but in the UK, construction has the highest suicide rate of any profession, any industry sector. That's pretty stark, isn't it? The chances of someone in your workforce dying from suicide are, are six times greater than of them dying from a fall from height, which a lot of us might think of as a key risk. Can we do anything to help with that? I think that's a good challenge. So back to my friend again. He's still digging. It takes a long time. If he wore a waistcoat and a flat cap, he could be Victorian as you saw in some of the earlier photos. We're struggling to help him at the moment because we haven't found a technology that digs that confined hole better than he can. We've thought about it quite a lot. Haven't found a way of doing it. So the message out of that, people are perhaps the neglected part, and we do need to do something about how we can use, thinking about how we can use smart infrastructure to help our people. So I'm going to finish off with an example, a case history, if you like, of, of something we've done recently. 
So this is a bit of uh, asset condition monitoring, essentially. Um, we're using the latest sensors with some smart technology backup to assess the condition of risk to a, of a, an asset to control risk. Um, but it, it's also, I think, quite a nice demonstration of thinking just a bit laterally about what we value and, and how we might address it. Because it took us out of the space we were normally in. So in this case, the interesting thing about this asset condition monitoring is the asset we're monitoring, the assets, are the people. My friend. The context was the bank station capacity upgrade, which is a current very large tunnelling project in London, now nearing completion, um, and some associated work on the Crossrail project, it's all tied in as part of the same study. Uh, that's actually a, just very recently at Bank, um, a challenging site there. The, the machine is trying to excavate uphill. You might think it was mining the ground. It's not really. It's actually having to mine through backfilled cast iron and concrete shafts from previous generations. And, and it's all safety critical work because all around that, there's lots more tunnels with trains and people in them. So it's a very demanding sort of project. 24-7 working because most tunnelling requires that to avoid leaving unstable conditions. And traditionally, we've always done this sort of thing, certainly in the UK, in 12-hour shifts. And in fact, when you work it out, in terms of legislative requirements now, we worked right on the limit of what the law allowed, to the extent that if we worked one minute more than our shift patterns demanded, technically that might have been illegal on some of these jobs. So are those shift patterns the right answer? Are they good value? What are our values here? Well, health and safety is a key one. Um, we're interested in risk related to fatigue because we suspect there is risk there. We are interested in legal compliance because, let's be honest, we don't want to be prosecuted. And we're, we're interested in welfare, making life better for our people. The opportunity that we've got was actually some sensors from another sector, happened to come out of the military originally, um, and some sense making, some clever algorithms that went with those sensors. And, and some trials were conducted, and I will name check Dragados and London Underground here because the two organisations work very well together to, to make this happen. They conducted a trial, uh, quite a long trial, a lot of people involved on the site over quite a prolonged period, and they actually tested different shift patterns because that was the variable we could control. So give you a feel for the sort of things we're talking about, we, we looked at people working back-to-back 12-hour -back shifts. Uh, we looked at an intermediate shift pattern because there was a thought that actually the night, risk, night shift was the big risk, so perhaps we'd work a, a long day but a short night see what that did. And we looked at shift patterns of three, eight hours, thereabouts. We also had some comparison with office staff and other staff on, on other patterns. The technology we used was um, produced by an outfit called Fatigue Science, and it's a product called the Ready Band. So it looks superficially like a Fitbit, but uh, there's a lot more behind this. Um, but essentially, it's, uh, it's detecting motion, um, so you wear it on your wrist all the time, and the data it collects is related to a calibrated, valibra validated database, um, allowing a pretty accurate indication of your state, whether you're awake, whether you're asleep, whether you're alert, are you experiencing micro-sleeps, which are characteristic of a, a fatigue condition. So that was the sensor technology. The algorithms with it allow us to define a scale of fatigue. And we know from the calibration that's been done that concern is generally where you've got a score of 70 or less on the, the index here. So we can identify which measurements, which times are of concern. The experiments allowed were to compare the different shift patterns that I've mentioned. 
to compare, interestingly, to compare whether it made a difference if we told the staff what the data was saying. So some of the trials were blind to the staff. They just wore the wristband but knew nothing else. And then some of the trials, the same staff, were given a phone app that allowed them to see what was happening with the data. A whole series of parallel exercises and some sub subjective assessment to provide uh, contextual data. So what do we learn? Well, on the, on the night shift, which we know and we can measure, is the highest risk time for fatigue. That's not a surprise. A 12-hour night shift, on average, looks something like that. 22% of the time, people are in the area of concern in terms of fatigue. It's not a, entirely a surprise. It doesn't necessarily mean they can't be working, but it's a warning sign. Compare that with an eight-hour shift. There's data from an eight-hour shift, otherwise the same conditions. The fatigue element drops. It's only 19% of the time. That's better. This, this is a big data sample, so this is quite statistically significant. So that's good. Shorter shift is helping. It's not made the problem go away, but it's helping. What I find really interesting is this one. This is also on the eight-hour shift. The difference here is not only have we made the shift shorter, we've now given the, the user the phone app. They can self-manage their time. They can see whether the measurements are saying they're tired. And we actually get a bigger drop there in the amount of fatigue we're seeing. That, that's quite powerful information. There are some other things we can get out of this. There's a wealth of data from this. This one's quite interesting. This is an indication of how much sleep people were getting before they went to the next shift. Um, first thing that strikes me on this is there's not many people getting even six hours sleep at all in the workforce. But if you look at the blue line, it's day shift. Um, it's roughly uniform through the week with perhaps a slight tendency to, to go up later in the week. So there's some cumulative tiredness perhaps. The really striking one is the night shift line, the red line. And uh, what happens at the start of the week? What this is telling us is... People just don't sleep before their first night shift. They'll do the, whatever they do in the day, probably, and then go to work. That rings some alarm bells, but any, any of you who've worked night shifts regularly, as those of us who've been on the underground have, will recognise that getting to sleep when you change your shift pattern is quite a difficult thing to do. Here's another one, again, comparing day and night. It, the effectiveness here is an overall um, measure of the, the state people are in. And on day shift, they're pretty constant, pretty good. But at night, they're measurably lower and dropping off more. We can superimpose this on some other stuff we know, like circadian rhythms. We know that generally any people tend to be least good at about four in the morning, probably best mid-morning. So we've got a whole series of observations and things we know. We, we can see things that control the fatigue risk. We can see which shift patterns make help with alertness. We can start to think about things like moving work around so we do the risky things at less risky times, perhaps. We also had some other benefits. We saw sick leave drop off as the workforce got less fatigued. That must be positive. We also, interestingly, saw productivity go up. And that's because, essentially because you tend to get much more continuous work out of an eight-hour shift. Um, longer 12-hour shifts tend to have a slow start and tend to trail off. So this changed the way we did business. The eight-hour shift effectively became the standard, was adopted on the back of this. The higher-risk tasks were moved out of the highest-risk periods. And we're now in the course of um, providing feedback into British standards initially because the Code of Practice for Safety in Tunnelling is under review at the moment. Uh, but there's the intent to publish this data more widely. So, the outcome of all that, we still haven't solved the problem of finding a better way of digging the hole for him. 
But I think we've made his life better because we, we can show we've reduced the risk. We've improved his wel welfare. So to reflect on that, would we have thought about welfare like this 10 or 20 years ago? I don't think we would. I don't think we valued it. Would we have had the technology to do this? No, we wouldn't have had that either. So given that we're, the answer to those are no, I think that's a real smart infrastructure success story and a lovely example of thinking laterally and moving, taking things from slightly different sectors, thinking about different types of things we value. So to conclude, in summary, I'm just going to summarise by making some suggestions for us as an industry. I think it will help us all if we identify and communicate more explicitly what it is we value. And I've suggested one way of formalising that a little. I think for our client sector, communicating the outcomes we want is absolutely crucial and we need to avoid being too prescriptive because you don't get innovation if you're prescriptive with your ask. For our technology providers, I think there's a real challenge to make sure that we relate our innovations to what we value. And then for the practitioners, which broadly might be quite a lot of us who sit in the middle sometimes in, in that dialogue, we need to compare our options logically and choose systematically between them. Maximising value, I think, is a very helpful way of thinking about that. Don't assume that yesterday's answer is still the best value answer today. And lastly, do remember our people are some of our most important assets. Thank you.